Um, so our first speaker today is going to be Philip Skur, um, who's currently the head of the metadata department at Stanford University. He earned a PhD in Stanford in medieval music theory and an MLIS from the University of California, Berkeley. He is the chair of the program for cooperative cataloging and has been deeply involved in the implementation of the new cataloging rules, research description, and access in the United States. With a mid-career move to Highwire Press, he developed an interest in the automated taxonomic analysis of digital text. And currently, he's in charge of coordinating linked data project development for the Stanford University Libraries. Um, initial areas of interest include the use of linked data as a mechanism for authority control, which we'll talk about today, in the digital library. The integration of linked data from uh, disparate sources and visualization environments. And our second speaker, uh, who may be, many of you may remember from uh, either from Seattle or earlier today when he presented, is uh, Richard Wallace, um, a distinguished thought leader in semantic web and linked data technology. Um, Richard joined OCLC in 2012 as technology evangelist. I love that, that title. Um, he's been at the forefront of the emerging web and semantic web technologies in the wider information world for more than 20 years. He's an active blogger and was a regular podcaster in the Talking with Callus series. From 2008 to 2010, he hosted and chaired the Library 2.0 Gang, a monthly roundtable podcast series that brought together thought leaders, movers and shakers, and executives from leading organizations in library technology. He most recently uh, was with Callus, a linked data and semantic web technology organization in the United Kingdom, where he is based in Birmingham, which I will get to visit uh, for the first time in September, so I have to um, so we will we'll hear from Philip first, and then Richard, and then we'll take uh, questions at the end. So, thanks to you. So thank you uh, very much for having me here today. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, what I call leveraging local authority data. So this is based in a project uh, that we have at Stanford that is called CAP, and it's, it's expansion into linked data and into the rest of the university. So what is CAP? So that is CAP is short for the Stanford Community Action Profiles. Uh, this is something which began in our medical school and. Uh, the medical school wanted to have a consistent interface for the professors to the community. Um, it is used for all Stanford uh, medical faculty uh, and for interns and for graduate students and postdocs. So the general profiles which are developed in CAP for the medical school have sections on general profile and contact information. Then they've got a section on professional overview which includes administrative appointments, professional education, honors and awards, graduate and fellowship program affiliations, community and international uh, work, and also some internet links. And then lastly, they have a section on scientific focus, which includes current research interests and uh, publications. Now the headings, which are used for the individual faculty that appear in the CAP profiles, come from the Stanford PeopleSoft software. So we know when they are set up, they have to be unique. They have a separate Stanford University ID. So even though their names might be identical, we can be assured that they are actually different people. Now the publications that are linked to their profiles is gen are generated from PubMed in an automated feed. So it works out very well for the Stanford Medical School because all of their publications do appear there and they are sent automatically to their profiles. One of the great things about the CAP system is that the medical subject headings mesh are used to analyze all the different parts of their profile. So that if you are looking at a certain publication by one of, this, one of these people and you want to see what other research areas they're interested in, if you're trying to find a collaborator in a certain topic, these mass subject headings link all the different parts of the profile, so it's sort of a lingua franca for finding anything you'd like to find out about these people. Now, <clears throat> this implementation has been so successful and had such a great uptake at the medical school, Stanford University decided that they would like to implement it for all of the campus. 
So, and uh, what was great about it is that they came to the libraries to do that implementation. So as part of the initial development for this program, the outreach to uh, the rest of the campus, uh, we have started to work on something called the Stanford Authority File. And it's sort of a mis bit of a misnomer, but once that we invented that name, it kind of stuck. So it's going to be there, I think, forever. So the Stanford Authority File will replace the automatic feed of those PubMed articles to the uh, fac medical faculty, and it is what will replace that feed to the, the rest of the faculty. So to start out with in that Stanford Authority File, we need to have a heading for all the Stanford professors and graduate students. And again, that is being generated from our PeopleSoft software, so we know that all those headings are going to be unique, even though all, we have many similar names on campus. Those headings um, are also being set up as URI, so they can be used as linked data, which is the whole point of the discussion here, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, some of the information in the profile whatever biographical information that can be taken from PeopleSoft and which can be shared legally. Um, the professors also will be able to say, we'd like to share this or not share this, but we will share whatever is, is possible in those um, profiles. <clears throat> now, unfortunately, the most difficult thing for us was trying to find a, a substitute for that feed from PubMed for all their journal publications. So we went out and we found a commercial vendor who will be supplying us with a whole list of publications of everybody at Stanford, or who they think, what they think all these publications are, and they will feed it to the Stanford Authority file and to all those individual profiles. Now, the Stanford Authority file will then take those um, publications and they will send them to all the faculty and say, we think this is binding. So, um, the sort of, the carrot for them is, once they get those suggestions, if they say, yes, this is by me, then it gets added to their resume, which everybody can see. And uh, if they don't add it, it won't show up on their resume. So that's kind of the positive way that we get to identify authors for articles. Um, if they reject something, again, that rejection comes back to the Stanford Authority file, so we can remove it from the list and say, we know that this is not by me. So a little bit more about the Stanford Authority file and its more of its connection with linked data. So we decided early on that it would be very important to have all of these authorities set up as your eyes for us and for others to be able to use as linked data. Internally, they had a lot of use for us. So they're very essential for us as far as the Stanford uh, repository goes. So, Often, many people on campus, a lot of their information gets set into the repository, and we need to know who it's by in a very explicit sort of way. So um, this will give us that URI and that authoritative heading for everything in the digital repository for Stanford people. <clears throat> also, very recently, the digital repository has set up a self-deposit interface for anybody on campus so that they don't need to go through the libraries to deposit anything. They can simply go to the web form. They can deposit it themselves. So when they go to this web form, they can log in using their Stanford ID number, and that will automatically get the URI from the Stanford Authority file. So again, we have that authoritative link, and we don't have to worry about form of name when they do something through self-deposit. And I think the other great thing this will, this will help with is in our large uh, data sets, which the library has also been assigned curatorship over. So again, they can be done by a number of groups at Stanford, and again, we can use these headings in the Stanford Name Authority file to positively ID um, who is responsible for those data sets when they get put into the data repository. Also, we're hoping that these <coughs> URIs will have a lot of use for people externally. So again, if you are working with journal publications from Stanford authors and you want to connect things up via linked data, there is going to be an established Stanford URI for all the Stanford faculty um, that you can use. So in my next few slides, I wanted to talk a little bit about sort of the ramifications of this. Um, what we were concerned about is, well, the picture is of Tower of Babel, and I don't think data is supposed to get around this, but it's like, is this just going to be another set 
the local URIs that people are going to have to wade their way through to try to find what they're looking for. So is it really adding to the confusion, or is it really helping out in some way? <clears throat> so just to be a little bit more explicit, uh, these were some of the three major discontinuities we saw between the Stanford Authority file that we try to, once we pull this all together. Uh, so the first is uh, the conflict between our regular Authority file and the Stanford Authority file. So as you all probably have uh, the same, you've got a local catalog in your ILS, and you go, the MARC records are sent to a traditional Authority vendor, and you'll get back authority records from the LC name authority file, which will go into the ILS authority file. So we have those headings, and now we're going to have many all the same authors in this new authority file. And how are we supposed to link them up? So that having those two separate authority files at Stanford for the same people seemed like not such a good idea. And then again, as I mentioned, we really were afraid that although these would be URI set up in a standardized way for all Stanford people, it was very low. So can't really expect people from all over the world to even know that this exists, let alone to be able to search it and find who they're looking for. And I think the last thing, which is more cap specific that we are concerned with, is that the vendor that we chose was able to supply us with all of the journal publications for these authors, but they were not able to supply us with the monographic publications. And it's true, I think, that uh, the predominance of the publications really is journal literature, but the monographs could be major, and those would not appear here. And so, uh, we thought we would start on a joint project with OCLC and VF, with an automated connection to the Stanford Authority file to try to solve some of these problems. <clears throat> so we're looking at this in two phases. In the first one, we will send our headings from the Stanford Authority file, first in batch when we, when we first create all the names and then subsequent updates. And we will do um, and develop an automated matching algorithm with them, with VF, so that we will be able to do some sort of automated matching of headings with them. Now in the phase two, which is the phase which I'm, well, I'm interested in at all, uh, but the part that I'm really interested in is what do we do when there's not a match? And we would love it if VF would create a heading automatically in VF for all the headings which do not have a match. So <clears throat> the benefits to both of us in this process were uh, quite a bit. So uh, VF would be able to get from Stanford all that biographical information about the authors that we have, about the departments they work in, um, it could be birth dates, it could be a lot of information which they are lacking in the VF profile. And also, if the vendor will permit, we can give them the citations for all the journal publications, which also which are lacking in the VF profiles for these individual authors. Now, on Stanford's part from VF, we could get the uh, copies of the identifiers which VF keeps. So there will be the VF identifier, there probably will be the LC name authority uh, identifier, it could be ISNES and maybe even ORCID identifiers, which then could be fed back to us for our file. Also, uh, there's a section in VF which includes monographic publications harvested from the WorldCat database. So that would be our link to try to get all those monographic publications that we are lacking then uh, from VF. <clears throat> So in thinking about this new model for authority creation, I think there are a number of great benefits for it. The first is that it is what I like to call automatic heading creation for routine entities. So this entire process that we're trying to set up, from the creation of the heading in the standard authority file, to the matching in VF, to if there's no match, the creation of a heading automatically in VF, is a, would be a 100% automated process. So, to me, I kind of look like it at purchasing copy from a vendor. You know, we're trying to get rid of the easy stuff so that we can concentrate our authority work on those headings which will take a lot of effort to try to establish. I think the second great thing this would help a lot with is that it will be um, establishing headings for journal authors. So, 
I'm in another group which is dealing with this in another context, but most catalog departments work on publishing, uh, cataloging monographs. So unless you have published a monograph, your name is not here in the standard authority files. And most journal authors, authors appear for publications of journal articles, often where their name is last name, first name, initial. So the disambiguation of this journal literature is a, is a big problem. So this would go a long way in establishing uh, consistent your eyes and authors for journal publication. I think also this exchange of data with um, local exchange of data with VF means that we get around that issue that we had with the, local, the authority file being such a local thing. So instead of being so focused on Stanford, people having to come to Stanford to find these headings, they'll find them represented in VF instead. So they're represented in sort of an international authority hub, which goes a lot to solve that issue. And last, the big issue uh, for us, <clears throat> help for us, was that we will be able to copy, get a copy of those national and international uh, name identifiers. So as I mentioned, one of the big issues for me personally would be that we would have these headings represented in our um, ILS authority file and have them in the Stanford authority file with no connection in between. Now if we get the identifiers from VF, from the LC name authority file, we'll be able to connect things through those identifiers and integrate the file in that way. So, <clears throat> given all those benefits, I have to admit there are still some problems to overcome to think about in this model. The first one is that uh, Stanford is a uh, sort of total RDA shop. So RDA will have certain rules for the way headings ought to be constructed. And this is a totally automated way of con uh, constructing headings. So we really need to take a look at the headings that are constructed and see whether they are um, RDA compliant or not. The second is, um, as Heather mentioned, I'm chair of the program for cooperative cataloging. So we are very involved um, <clears throat> in the PCC requirements for how records ought to be created. And again, right now, PCC has some very stringent requirements about uh, record creation and authorities for them. And right now, the authority to support a heading in your bibliographic record is supposed to be in the LC name authority file. Uh, we are starting to have that discussion now about whether it will be legal for PCC catalogers to be able to use headings from other um, well-established catalog, but right now it's just LC, the LC name authority file, and these headings would just be in VF. So we have a little bit of a discontinuity there. And the last thing I think for us to think about is um, bid frame, and this concept in bid frame authorities of this lightweight abstraction layer, whatever that is meant to be. So as I understand it, it's supposed to be sort of a lightweight authority file hosted at a local institution for the entities in your records. So I think the last thing, the very last thing that we'd like to do is to set up two different local Stanford authority files, one Stanford authority file for this, for the CAP process, and yet another authority file for the bit frame process. So somehow we, we have to have a single authority file, local authority file, to cover both those things. But again, I think this uh, particular project is a great example of uh, leveraging a very local linked data experiment uh, for much broader integration impact in the outside world. So, thank you very much.